He's a novelist, a short story writer, essayist, now playwright, as well as diplomat. We think of Carlos Fuentes, whose two most recent books, A Distant Relations, a novel of which we perhaps can talk about, as well as short stories called Burnt Water, uh, Farrar Straucher of the Publishers. And he tells me of his new play. But first of all, I've got to ask about you. Yeah. Uh, since the last time we met, uh, to me, you represent two cultures in one. You were the Mexican ambassador to Paris, to France. You come from a legacy of such richness, the Hispanic legacy. So yourself, is this... I sense in distant relations, your most recent mm -hmm. novel, what some call Proustina nature and delicate and very gripping, almost as urinant throughout, uh, that, uh, as though there were this, not conflict, conflict, yeah, and fusion yes. at the same time, of the two, of two cultures, European and New World. Yeah, of course, we've been fighting this out uh, since the beginning of our, of our lives. Uh, the old world and the new world. It has been in conflict for you as Americans, as North Americans, uh, and witness Hawthorne and Henry James and Hemingway and Scott Fitzgerald. It's been a constant problem for your identity. It certainly has been for us and for the very simple reason that we were the utopia of the old world. We were the utopia of Europe. That's why we were discovered, because we were desired. And uh, then the very people who decide this utopia with its good savage and its golden age promptly destroyed it, uh, made it impossible, reduced it to ashes, to slavery. And when we reach independence from uh, our uh, utopianists, we in turn transform Europe into our utopia. Yeah. Uh, now we want to be like you. We're free. We want to be like you. We want to become Europeans. Uh, that was another failure, a double failure. We were not the U utopia of Europe. Europe could not be our utopia. We must be ourselves, they must be themselves, yet the cultures must be open to one another, and they can give a lot to one another on the condition that we do not idealize ourselves, that we do not convert uh, each one of ourselves into the utopia of the other. Then we fail. We fail miserably. As you're mm. talking, this very time we're talking, perhaps it'll be resolved one way or another by the time this is on the air, but mm. I, though I doubt it. Something ridiculous, absurd, and tragic is going on, yes. involving the two worlds. Of course. An yes. old empire, yeah. Britain, Britannia rules the waves, and some vestigial remainder of an empire called the Falklands. Argentina, run by a fascist junta, yes. calls it <clears throat> Malvinas, and young men are dying, both yes. English-speaking and Spanish-speaking. Well, uh, th this ties in very well with your first question, Studs, because we're witnessing, in a way, uh, one of the final skirmishes of one of the oldest running wars in history, which is the war between the Spanish Empire and the British Empire, the English Empire. This began with Philip II and Elizabeth the Virgin Queen and the Invincible Armada. It's been going on um, uh, ever since. Uh, it's something very deeply felt, especially on the sides of the losers, which have been the, the Hispanic, um, Hispanic peoples. There are many questions to ponder about this uh, tragic comic affair, because it is tragic comic in some ways. Uh, we, we think in Latin America that the Malvinas are, belong to Argentina uh, because uh, the territory is inherited uh, by the Spanish-speaking republics from the Spanish Empire uh, naturally belong to them. And after all, they were under Argentinian rule until, until the British took them away in 1833. That's all very good. Uh, but what has been revealed here is most extraordinary. It is the depth of Latin American nationalism uh, beyond ideologies, the fact that the great, great supporters of uh, Argentina, which is, as you have just said, a fascist regime and one of the most brutal, repressive, horrendous regimes we have ever seen in Latin America, uh, is uh, supported by a democracy such as Venezuela and by two of the uh, uh, left socialist regimes of the hemisphere, Cuba and Nicaragua. They're all for this uh, blessed junta. Uh, it makes you wonder. It makes you understand something the United States has trouble in understanding. I think it's uh, time it understood it, that uh, the deepest seated ideology in Latin America is conservative nationalism. Nationalism, by its very nature, is uh, not socialist. Socialism means internationalism. Uh, we are nationalists, conservative nationalists, who sometimes dress up as Marxists in order to frighten the United States, hmm? to make faces, to uh, 
play the boogeyman. Uh, but if we could play it with a Catholic mask, we would do it also, you see. Uh, the important thing is to affirm our profound sense of nationalism. This is the, the, the profoundest reality of Latin America, and it has surfaced so evidently in the uh, conflict of uh, the South uh, Atlantic. Here you have uh, <coughs> a repressive regime in uh, Argentina, and uh, the head of the junta, General Galtieri, shedding tears for the young men who have tragically fallen in the, uh, in the skirmishes in the, in the South Atlantic. And also a famous tango singer called Libertad La Marque, whom I saw on television a few days Libertad. ago. Libertad La Marque, Libertad. she's the most famous tango singer, crying also, singing the tango, oh, my little sister Malvina, come back to me, you belong to me, etc. And um, I'm saying uh, several things to myself. Uh, here are the tango singer and the dictator, both shedding tears for the dead soldiers, but uh, forgetting the 20,000 uh, Argentinians who have been killed by the junta, who have disappeared, tortured, been uh, thrown into the ocean, butchered, uh, who cries for them? Here are the Argentinian military demanding sovereignty over the Malvinas Islands, which I'm willing to grant to Argentina, but on the condition that Argentina also has sovereignty over itself, that the people have a sovereignty over their own country, which they don't have in Argentina, you see. It is a, a terrible mix-up, a, a, a tragedy and a comedy. At the same time, it hurts my feelings as a Latin American very, very much. There's so many things to add to this study, if I may go on for a minute. Oh, I hope so. Which is simply the, uh, the outrageous stupidity and blunders of American foreign policy in uh, the region. How the Malvinas affair has revealed that, in effect, American foreign policy everywhere, but especially in Latin America, is no policy at all that it reacts on day-to-day -day happenings and circumstances. Uh, uh, think, uh, Studs, what were the Argentinian military to think? when uh, Jean Kirkpatrick says uh, uh, she adores them. They are the beloved children of the Reagan administration. And Under Secretary Anders goes down there to repeat the message. And uh, when Secretary Haig is questioned in the Senate about foreign aid to Argentina and asked, what do we have in common with the Argentinian regime, Mr. Secretary, he answers, the believe in God, Mr. Senator, the believe in God. Uh, they are uh, inducted, the Argentinian military, by the United States into invading Nicaragua. They were going to be the mercenaries for the invasion of Nicaragua and also for the invasion of El Salvador if it was needed so that American troops would not be there but Latin troops. With all, this, uh, with all these green lights, these signals, the Argentinian military, suffering from uh, a profound internal crisis, inflation, unemployment, the total failure of the Milton Friedman, economic plan in Argentina. Pardon me, was the Milton Friedman plan tried in Argentina? Oh, yes, it is. As it, it was in Chile. Oh, yes, yes, with tremendous yeah. effects, with an absolute failure. It is one of the reasons of the economic crisis Argentina is suffering. And these are all the reasons why the Argentine military felt impelled to distract the attention of the people in Argentina and uh, to profit from what they believed was a favorable, favorable international situation to invade the Falkland Islands, the, the Malvinas. And the United States was, as usual, caught with its pants down and forced uh, to choose in public between two alliances. This shouldn't happen to Uganda, that to have to be forced to choose between the Rio Treaty and the NATO Treaty in public and to have to sacrifice one of these alliances, one of these treaties, which in this case is the Latin American alliance, is, 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 is tremendous. I mean, this, uh, this wouldn't happen to, uh, this wouldn't happen to a second year, uh, second grade uh, pupil in international relations. It is astounding that it should happen to the most powerful country in the world. I can't believe it. I can't believe that it has come about because uh, many things are unsure about the South Atlantic crisis. I think what is sure is that the Monroe Doctrine is dead, and good riddance, I say, uh, that uh, Latin America has fallen into a profoundly anti-American, anti-North American stance, that it will take years for the United States to rebuild the minimum of a consensus in Latin America, that it's much proclaimed policy in Central America to thwart 
Soviet and Cuban intervention has gone down the drain, I don't know for how long, that the military are saddled in power, the extreme reactionary military right is saddled in power. Our government has helped. In El Salvador, in El Salvador. And Chile. And in Chile, and in Argentina. And uh, that the United States faces a horrendous failure of policy throughout Latin America. And then the other side of this, you say, tragic comic situation. It would be certainly wildly comic in Gilbert and Sullivan were not the tragic loss of young lives. Oh, yes. I mean, you have the British. Then you have an old piece of colony of theirs mm -hmm. when Britannia ruled the waves. Mm -hmm. You have Mrs. Thatcher, who some would describe as Ronald Reagan and drag. You have her, and you have a dilemma there, unemployment as well. Mm -hmm. So you have another side of it too, don't you? Well, yes, yes, you have the, uh, the, the side of the, the remnants of, uh, British, um, of British colonialism. Because it is colonialism. When they say, uh, no, but the Kelpers, uh, um, the Kelpers have their own institutions and uh, the Argentinians are uh, going, going to submit them to a military dictatorship, the fact is that the Kelpers are not British citizens. They have not been granted the status of citizens by the crown in England, so they are colonial subjects. There's also that aspect, and one finds it difficult also to sympathize with the government that uh, has not been shy in shooting at the Irish. And so I suppose the, the, the obvious answer replied all would have been, of course, sitting down at the table and discussing. The only solution is a diplomatic uh, solution, a negotiated solution, basically at the UN and through the good offices of the Secretary General, Javier Perez de Cuellar. That is the only solution I found, on more or less on the basis of what has been discussed, that is uh, still fire and uh, an interim administration by the United Nations and uh, negotiations. That's you know, the only solution uh, I have. Uh, you know, it would have been uh, m much more easier, convenient and cheaper for everyone concerned if uh, uh, Great Britain had been paid a million dollars, a million dollars for each of the kelpers mm -hmm. to send them back to Britain to resettle them in the United Kingdom. It would have uh, come uh, to uh, uh, less of a cost than uh, the cost of a war studs, where I'm afraid that more people are going to be killed, more soldiers are going to be killed than inhabitants the Falkland Islands have. There's a poem by Bertolt Brecht that directly connects with the absurd situation. It's about the anonymous of history, those who, who pay the whoever it is, whatever piper there is. And he asks, who built the seven gates of Thebes? And then he says, where did the Masons go when the Chinese wall was built? When Caesar conquered Gaul, was not even a cook in the army, and finally, closer to home, when the Armada sank, and of course every school child in the United States knows the year 1588, Sir Francis Drake leading and conquering the Spanish Armada, and thus Britannia ruled the waves. When the Armada sank, we read that King Philip wept, and then asked Brecht, were there no other tears? He also said, um, I did not send my men uh, to fight the elements. Uh, that might be ironically reversed, and Margaret Thatcher might have to say that today, I did not send my men to fight the elements, the waves and the cold yeah. in, the South, uh, in the South Atlantic. But, you know, um, the, 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 these historical rancors die so hard. Let me tell you, tell you a small anecdote. Yeah. The Sunday Times, back in the early 60s, sent a um, photographer down to Mexico to help me in doing a, a piece on Mexico for the London Sunday Times. He was a very good-looking young man in his 20s with long, long blonde hair, which was uh, something new in Mexico at the time. We used to go around villages and mountains of Mexico, and the Indians would do one or two things. They would throw stones at him, at the English boy, or they would uh, sing, uh, Christ, 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 at him. In any case, he fell in love with a Spanish girl and uh, told me one day, listen, I want to marry her, but I don't dare go near her father, who is a terrible man, a Spaniard who growls at me. Would you intercede and ask him for the hand of his daughter, which I did? And the father said, what? A daughter of mine, a daughter of a Spaniard, marry the son, a son of the perfidious Albion that sunk our armada in 1588. My Never. God. I said, oh my God, but this happened. <laughs> That's incredible. This happened so four these, centuries ago, okay. <laughs> these memories, die memories, hard. historic die memories, hard. die hard. They die hard. 
You know, you know, I think one of the best definitions of the war in the South Atlantic was given by the London Observer. He said, this is like two bald men fighting over a comb. <laughs> <laughs> two bald men fighting over a comb. Yes. Of course. It's so useless, finally. So this leads to so a useless. big question. You speak of how strong nationalism is. Well, apparently, you say strong in the Latin American countries. Isn't it so? Everybody, you know, Einstein, before he died, mm. was saying the human race would jump to quantum leap technologically, scientifically. Unless we can overcome whatever these barriers that separate people, mostly through nations, race of course, but through nations, he says, there will be catastrophe. So how does one... I guess nationalism is needed when a country discovers itself an ex yes. colony. You, you, you're very intelligent. That is the problem, because yeah. I am against nationalism. And I see how terrible it is in today's world, how useless, how anachronistic, uh, how uh, absurd, because nations are so interlocked. It is so difficult to do anything against any other nation, because by hurting it, you are hurting yourself. Vide Poland and the Soviet Union and Argentina, and everywhere you look, it is the same problem. Yet, as a Mexican, as a man of the third world, uh, I have to say, yes, it's all very good for an American, a Frenchman, an Englishman to say this uh, because their nationhood is something acquired, achieved. They go to bed every night without worrying about the fact, am I uh, am or am I not? Do I have or do I not have a national identity? But for countries that are forming themselves, that are half-baked half countries, that are countries uh, assailed uh, by military menaces, by transnational corporations, by a million things that uh, make it impossible for them to decide their own destiny, then nationalism, of course, uh, comes forward as a valuable asset, as an ideology you must consider. And it's very conflictive for far-sighted, intelligent, liberal people yeah. in these countries <clears throat> to uh, sort out this conflict. So it's, it's a great dilemma for us. Yeah. So when we speak of one world, mm -hmm. you know, and the world federalism, yeah. it doesn't quite dig what you dig, what you experience as, as a man of... No, of because we, we think of world federalism, we think of a world dominated by the United States. Where the United States imposes its values, imposes its interests. Uh, uh, it's another word for United States nationalism, rampant, gone amok. So we don't want this. Yeah. But we have to have limit. Uh, I, I think that the future of the world, the good future of the world for the time being, are important regional blocks that transcend mm. uh, provincial nationalism and that also transcend the bipolar uh, two power mm. structure of the world today. Uh, I, I want to begin with, I want a world in which, besides the Soviet Union and the United States, you have a multi power structure mm. that includes uh, Latin America, Islam black Africa, Japan, China, India, and both Europe's, if possible. Why don't I talk of that for the, mm -hmm. I said the phrase third force for a moment? Third force. You're talking now about... Because we do have these two macho figures. He spoke of the two bald-headed men fighting over a comb, the London Observer, discussing yeah. Malvinas uh, Falkland, mm -hmm. dash one. If you're English, it's one of your Argentinian. Let's call it with their original French name, yeah. the Malouine. The Malouine. Malouine, they were founded, you know, they were named by sailors from Saint-Malo in France, and therefore called the Malouine. Well, why not give it back to France? That's a good idea. It'd be a socialist, uh, <laughs> a socialist territory of the French Republic. Mitterrand would govern them. <laughs> but since you mentioned the two superpowers, yes. and you mentioned the, the London Observer analogy of the two bald-headed men fighting over a comb yes. in the Falcon Malvinas manner, here is U.S. and U.S.S.R., and I have the analogy of two macho, muscular young men, not too bright, neither one too bright, going at each other in souped-up cars, playing the game of chicken. Here you mean. Oh, yes, Who yes, will blink yes, first? Yes, yes, we'll neither blink. blinks. One uh, blinks. We have two dead, dumb young men. Mm -hmm. But why should mega millions of innocents die along with them? No, I, I agree. It's, uh, it's absolutely ridiculous. And um, um, First, uh, although I repeat, I consider the Malvinas uh, to be uh, part of Argentina, not an extension of the British Empire, uh, I think that the, when the uh, Argentinians say, yes, we've been discussing this 
for 17 years we've been negotiating with the British and it has got us nowhere. Well, I, I sense an absolute lack of political imagination on the part of the Argentinian junta, something that does not surprise me. They have no political imagination. They think as thugs, as murderers, which is what they are. And um, if they wanted to mobilize Latin American opinion and third world opinion, they could have done it without the need of the use of force. I think the results of uh, the crisis show how deep the pro-Argentinian sentiment was in Latin America. Uh, and I think when that sentiment exists, you could have probed it politically and diplomatically and uh, mobilized it instead of um, <clears throat> in taking the solution of force and creating the situation mm. in which young people are dying. You know, uh, <clears throat> one of the interesting things about the, the, the crisis, its violent aspect, is that a certain colonel called uh, Arturo Astiz has been captured by the English in South Georgia Island. And this man is one of the most nefarious torturers in uh, Argentina. He's a sort of Argentinian Eichmann. He uh, murdered um, a Swedish citizen taken up because of pure suspicion on a street and then he uh, murdered two French nuns whom he dubbed the flying nuns because after torturing them and killing them he threw them off a helicopter into the ocean. And it would be interesting if uh, the Swedish and the French governments decided to uh, ask for the return, I mean for the handing over of this criminal to be judged in, uh, by French or Swedish uh, courts and uh, make people remember the nature of the Argentinian uh, regime. What do you think may happen? This here, asking you for a prognosis yeah. is so difficult. Uh, assuming that uh, it seems to be the case, the Argentinian junta uh, they will lose, uh, at least militarily. And the news, it seems, the Argentinian people are getting is not, is not that close to the truth. What will happen when, after the deaths of so many young Argentinians, Will the Argentinian people still back Galtieri? No, no, I, I don't think anybody backs Galtieri. They back the patriotic yeah. uh, Malvinas uh, issue. Uh, I think the junta will fall in that case. I think that finally both uh, Galtieri and uh, Thatcher are going to fall, as a matter of fact, but I think uh, uh, Galtieri will fall. The uh, majoritary political movement in the country, which is the Peronist movement, will come to power. And they wouldn't open their arms to the Soviet Union. Mm. And the United States will have achieved its um, principal purpose, which is, of course, giving the Soviet Union a foothold in the southern cone of the Americas. And there we are. You're talking about a, a, really a self-defeating policy pursuit. Oh, yes, yes, like, yes. Terribly self-defeating. Yeah. Incredibly dumb. Incredibly dumb. There's no other way to qualify yeah. it. By the way, you've been a... Dip we, we, now we, we... There's the other aspect of Carlos Fuentes, the novelist and diplomat. And you and two cultures, in this novel, I found very haunting, indeed, distant relations, some describe it as a Jamesian novel, that there is a narrator, an old aristocratic French count, telling a story to... And he's not the narrator. He's telling the story to the narrator. To the narrator, yeah. Who the narrator turns out to be, and I'm not betraying a secret, it's very Carlos Fuentes. Yes. Now, you're there, you, you are a... You yourself are of a sense of two cultures. Mm -hmm. You are of a Hispanic culture, and in, we've talked about a couple of wonderful short stories in Burnt Water, dealing with legacy and background and yes. heritage yes. and nostalgia. At the same time, you're the highly sophisticated European, too. Has this been a, a conflict in you, Carlos? Not to a great degree in me. I don't think it has been. No, no, no. I've been able to participate in my several worlds for the simple reason that I grew up that way because my father was a diplomat because uh, I was made to feel at ease in the United States, in Europe, and in Latin America, the three, the three regions, uh, the three cultures where um, I grew up. No, for me it is not being a conflict, but I think it is, it is a conflict. It is a conflict in historical, cultural, social terms. And therefore, I try to deal with it. But of course, I reinvent my destiny, my personal destiny in the novel, because after all, what is a novel for if yeah. not to invent destinies? We invent destinies, including our own. Yes. Why should not we reinvent our own destiny in a novel, which is what I do in distant relations? In that one, well, throughout, 
there, there's uh, someone, Branley, who's telling the story to the narrator, yeah. meets the father and son, the father and archaeologist, Hugo Heredias, yes. and his son, spoiled young, mm-hmm. and his uh, brutish kid, yeah. in a sense, too. And the boy haunts the Count Branley. Yeah. It's not death in Venice. I don't mean that. The boy no, haunts no, no, him. No, no, no. The no boy haunts him. And because the old man is looking for a youth that he no longer, somewhere along the line, isn't it? There are many things that want to be accomplished that have not been accomplished because of lack of love or lack of will or lack of imagination or pure accident in time and history. And this young boy, this terrifying, diabolical little boy, Victor Heredia, is uh, indeed haunting uh, the Count because... Uh, he's reminding him of his youth and of the fact that when he was playing in the Parc Monceau in Paris as a little boy, there was another little boy behind uh, behind uh, some beleveled windows in a house overlooking the park, uh, demanding to be admitted, demanding to play with the uh, Branly and with his friends, and he refused to take that little step we so often refuse to take, which is offering your hand to someone sending the ball back to someone mm-hmm. and therefore admitting him into your circle and giving a sense to his life and breaking the shell of his solitude. <clears throat> he was not able to do this. And the young boy reminds him of this and he is grateful for this because he realizes, a man of 84, that he could have died before the young boy yeah. was born. And the young boy also realizes that he could have been born after the old man died and that magical meeting might not have taken place. But he's also there for another reason, and it is to uh, recapture the other half of something that is lost, which is symbolized by an object found near a Mexican pyramid. And only half of it is found. And the little boy is in a mysterious pilgrimage. This is not spelled out in the novel at all. It is very implicit. He's in a mysterious to recover the, uh, the other half of a sacred object and to recover the other half of another little boy who is a little boy who is half monstrous who is an angel from the waist up, but is a sort of beast or fawn uh, from the waist uh, down. Yes. So there are many implications of this theme of haunting that you're... Which also leads to the New World and the European world, but come to the other half of the Herodias family, Herodias family. And uh, the book we're talking about is Distant Relations, a novel, very haunting one, published by Farrar, Strauss, and Giraud. In fact, the publisher of his uh, previous ones, too. The Count now tells the narrator, the man you're talking to, you, he tells him also about another, another half of the family. Uh, the father's son, the boy who haunts him, are Mexican. Or they're the father of the archaeologist. Yes. Whereas now he's talking about another family in France named Herodias. The, the older mm. man bears the boy's name, Victor, mm. is wondering. Now here is another wholly different aspect. He's not the thoughtful, elegant, archaeologist, thoughtful man. Someone wholly different, someone who's made a lot of money. Yes, uh, he has the whole history of uh, European colonialism in the Caribbean behind him. Huh? He has been an exploiter. Uh, he has engaged in the slave trade, in white trade. He has furnished uh, armies of uh, French and Spanish and English invaders with women and booze and... Uh, uh, and now he has behind him this uh, uh, terrible, uh, this terrible history, which uh, somehow um, has to be redeemed. And here's again when the little boy comes in, because uh, the twist of the novel, as against the traditional, the traditional uh, stance of uh, the uh, innocence of the new world being corrupted by the uh, old world. Here, finally, you have uh, that under the guise of innocence, the new world returns to corrupt the old world. Uh, The old world is nothing but a a mass of half-digested memories, of fears, of uh, lies. Uh, The novel, historically, you know, is constructed through a series of non-sequiturs because nothing fits uh, chronologically. All the stories the old Heredia in Paris tells uh, cannot be true in the sense that they don't fit together. 
uh, the, the, the mother uh, was living at the time of Napoleon I, uh, inaugurating the fashions of the first empire in the, in, in the, in the colony of Venezuela. Uh, she was an old whore during the empire of Maximilian of Austria and Mexico. Uh, wh wh what is this uh, world? What is this pack of uh, indigested history, this ignorance of the new world, I mean to say, this profound ignorance of the other in which you lump things together. You know, this is really an illustration of that famous thing that happens to you in, uh, in European countries, in France uh, or in Britain, in which uh, somebody knows you're Mexican and then they say, oh, you're Mexican, listen, I have a cousin living in yeah. Buenos Aires. Okay. Would, you, would, you, uh, would you send her the, 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 this uh, box of chocolates? When yeah. you go by, would yeah. you give it to her? Yeah. They, they ignore everything. You know, as you say, <laughs> yeah. to extend even a step further, yeah. uh, using Africa, an extreme case, yeah. Whenever I meet many young Africans, whether it be Nigerians or Ghanaians yes, yes. or Tanz Tanzanians, mm -hmm. and invariably they say, oh, I say, you're Lagos or Ibadan. I say, or most of the cab drivers say, yeah. how do you know that? How do you know that? I say, well, you're Lagos or you have Makra. He says, you're the first <laughs> one. Uh, they all say, oh, Africa. They think it's yeah. all one. Oh, wow. Instead of a thousand dialects, 150 cultures. in, in different, And so it's this... Ignorance is there not of several of dozen world. nations? So this yes, is true yes. Of it, it's, about it's equally Latin true, America and that's in a way uh, illustrated in this. Uh, it's just a jumble for for the French Heredia. It is a tremendous jumble. So it, so it is the profound yeah. unity, the cultural but also the carnal unity. That